Dvalin, balin, kili, fili, nori, ori, tori, oin, guloin. I'm sorry, this seems to be a completely different script. <clears throat> Dwarves and elves. The creatures are well known for us all. But do we really know the source of inspiration for authors like Tolkien and Terry Brooks? whose work rely heavily on the old creatures that have their roots in several mythologies, but have a very central role in Norse mythology. Today we will dive deep into the creatures of the Norse realm and the worlds they belong to. While the gods were busy with organizing and creating the worlds, maggot-like creatures came out of the flesh of Ymir, the Jotun slain and then used to create Midgar, the future homes of humans. Once the world was illuminated by Sol, the maggots were noticed by the gods and Odin called them before him. They were given form and then divided into two groups, elves of light and dark. The dark elves were cunning, treacherous, and enjoyed life underground. Therefore, they were given Svartalfheim, also called Nidavellir, an underground realm dominated by forges and mines. Being crafty, they knew that their art was sought after and would therefore demand a hefty price whenever they would craft something, whether it be God or man. Known as dwarves, gnomes, and kobolds, they would explore the deep realms of Nidavellir and seek out silver, gold, and other precious metals and jewels. This they hid in the crevices and mark those for when they needed them again. Among the nobler dwarves were four stout fellows, Nurdi, Saldri, Astri, and Westri, and they would hold the sky up to the end of time. The dwarves would be close to the Norse gods, providing them with gifts, great works, and sometimes troubles. The lighter version of elves were sent to the realm above Nidavellir, Alfheim. This lay between heaven and earth and was inhabited by fairies and light elves. Some called it Jusalfheimer, and the elves and fairies of this realm could move freely between heaven and earth to tend to plants, trees, and all the creatures of the forest. Little else has survived about them, but some tell of stories with them, Skadi and Ullr, the two gods that shared the forest of the Norse universe as their realm. Odin then gathered all the gods that existed at this point upon the height of Idavol, a plain far above Midgard. This realm was separated from the rest of the world by the stream that would never freeze over, Ifing. He declared this to be a hallowed place and named it Osgard, the land of the Esir. With him stood twelve Esir, the male gods, and twenty-four Asinjur, the female deities. A council was held to determine how to rule the realm, and it was decided that no blood could ever be shed on the ground of Osgod. The gods gathered up their weapons and from them built magnificent and awe-inspiring palaces from where they could rule in harmony. This was a time of peace, and it was known as the Golden Age of the Esir. One day, Odin, Vili, and Ve, the two brothers of Odin, were walking along the shore of Osgard, and they came upon two logs shaped in the form of humans. The three gods were st 
The three gods were transfixed by this curious event, but decided then to give the wood sculptures life. Odin bestowed upon the form souls, while Vili gave the logs senses and motion, and finally they gifted the humans blood and healthy skin. They were both named after the type of wood they were created from, Osk, Ash, for the man, and Embla, Elm, for the woman. The gods thought that the newly created creatures needed a realm worthy of the creation of the Ezir, so they gave the humans the realm of Midgard, the world created upon the corpse of Ymir, bestowed with thought and speech, Blessed by the love of the gods, the first two humans started to build a life on the shore of Midgard. The lands were theirs to rule as they saw fit. Soon Midgard was filling with the descendants of Ask and Ambla, and all of them were watched over by the gods. Odin then planted the great world tree, Yggdrasil, at the center of all the nine worlds. It was the tree of the universe, life and time, sinking its roots into the depths of Niflheim, where the well of all the water in the world, Vergelmir, was found, stretching its branches over Midgard, across Mimir's well, to the shores of Osgard, to the fountain of Urdar. The branch, Lerdar, bowed down towards Odin's hall, Valhall, where his high seat of Lidshalf ruled over all Osgard. An eagle sat on the branch, surveying the world of the gods. The name of that eagle was lost to time, but its companion, Vedafolnir sat between its eyes. Vedafolnir's eyes pierced through all the worlds and reported what he saw to the eagle. Yggdrasil was evergreen, never withered, so the gods could view its beauty for all seasons, and so would the souls of humans who gazed upon it from Valhall or Folkvanger. Odin's goat, Heidunr, would eat the leaves of Yggdrasil and the grass of Osgard, and from her others flowed the heavenly mead of the gods. So were the three stags, Dain, Dvalin, and Dunir, whose antlers would produce honeydew that dripped down to Midgard, forming all the rivers of the human realm. In the depths of the roots of Yggdrasil, slithered from the well of Vergilmir, was a horrible serpent. Nidhugr was its name, and it spent its days gnawing on the roots of the great world tree, as it knew if it fell, the world would end. The great worm had help from maggots and other slithering creatures of the depths, in its endeavor, and some day they might succeed. Along the trunk of Yggdrasil, a small creature would scamper up and down, bringing tales of toing and throwing of all the creatures of the nine worlds, often talking to Odin. Ratatoskir was its name, and as a small squirrel, it would go unnoticed and listen to what was said. It would also spend its time telling the eagle what Nidhaugr said about it and the other way around, spurring on conflict between the two. The Norns, the tellers of fate and deciders of destiny for both gods and men, were given the holiest of tasks. In addition to cutting threads of life for all creatures, they would sprinkle water from the sacred spring Urdar, the purest water in all of existence, 
onto the roots of Yggdrasil. The water would then trickle down the roots and into the tree spreading to all trees, leaves and flowers and eventually giving up honey for the bees. Above all the realms stretching from Osgard to Niflheim, arching above Midgard, was the sanctified bridge of Bifrost. The rainbow would let the gods move across the realms, visit any place in existence. They used it as a way to Urdar to hold council with the Norns, and to Niflheim to visit the dead. The only one of the gods who would not use it was Thor, the protector of humanity. He feared that his massive frame would crack the great bridge and shatter it into all the colors of the rainbow. He would instead use his chariot to travel to Midgar when he needed to. Heimdall, the son of nine mothers, was given the task of watching the bridge and sounding Yalarhorn if the Jotuns ever came back. That horn would also sound on the final day of the Nine Worlds. The last of the Nine Worlds is Vanheim, the home of the Vanir. Though the Azir were the first gods, they were not the only ones. The Vanir came to the realm in the early days, before the golden abodes of the Esir were built. They were gods of sea, wind, and fertility, so they would focus on the good parts of life. But as with the Jotun, their ways were different from the Esir, so conflict was unavoidable. First, I want to thank everyone who shared, liked, commented, and gave me feedback on the first part of Fjord Folklore. It means the world to me to know that even a small part of the YouTube community finds what I have to say and think of some value. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. This is probably the lesser known part of the creation myth in Norse mythology. Very rarely is it brought up in modern renderings from the myths and sagas how the various folk of the nine worlds were created and spread apart from maybe the creation of humanity in the form of Ask and Embla. And why is it the nine worlds? The number nine is repeated on many occasions in Norse myth. Uh, nine mothers for Heimdall, nine worlds, uh, spoiler alert, Odin spending nine days and nights hanging from Yggdrasil, uh, Ege's nine daughters, and Thor taking nine steps before dying during Ragnarok. Nine seems, along with a few other numbers, to have meant a lot to Norse people. This has also been a discussion within the study of mythology for years, and like a lot of stuff from surviving myths, nothing can be absolutely certain. So remember that when you listen to my analysis of things, is that this is one man's opinion, one who has studied Norse myth mythology for for years but it's still very hard to recreate something that's been dead for a thousand years one theory that seems to fit with a nine um, being important is that uh, Norse people had a nine a 27 day month calendar three another important number times nine personally I'm not sure if that comes from the calendar or the calendar comes from the importance of the number but nine seems very important in other European Indo-European mythologies like nine muses in Greek mythology so it's not a stretch to think that it might have been important in proto-European cultures and therefore the number of days in a month 
is derived from the importance of the number. Now, one of the worlds that has not been mentioned in this part of the creation myth so far is that of Helheim. This is kind of deliberate on my part as I want to talk about it more in depth when we get to Loki's monster's children, Hel, Jormungandr, and Fenrir. Uh, Helheim is, after all, ruled by his daughter, the uh, aforementioned Hel, not Odin's sister, sorry, Marvel fans. And I really want to get into her importance in the video where I tell of her and her siblings, which is more later in the chronology of the myth narrative. Now for the moment we've all been waiting for. Let's talk about the dwarves. First, I use dwarves, not dwarfs, as that is the pure... Um, plural for the mythical folk, not necessarily humans of small stature. Uh, the other is a term for multiple human beings of various disorders that limits their skeletal growth uh, and often not, and, and it's often not accepted by their community, so I stay away from that. Dwarves of Norse myth are an extremely interesting folk that has spread through popular culture, especially through the work of professor in Old Norse at Oxford University, J.R.R. Tolkien, often called the father of modern day fantasy. They seem to be the embodiment of physical creativity, often represented through crafting weapons and jewelry for the Esir, but they are also seen as cunning and vengeful. This can often be seen in the competition they have between the different families or clans they have, uh, especially when it comes to presenting gifts to the gods, arranging bets with Loki, or tricking Sigur Fovnesbana to kill family members. Um, not Sigur's, but their own. In Indo-European myths, like the Norse, creativity is often represented as a double-edged sword or that the creativity might come from something less desirable. Uh, Hephaestus in Greek mythology is often presented as a hunched and ugly creature, but he is the smith of the gods and also the god of forges and metallurgy, uh, something that is very useful for the gods, but they do not seem to appreciate it. For instance, when he sets up a trap, an ingenious trap, by the way, to catch his wife Aphrodite cheating on him with her lover Ares. The god, instead of praising the genius of Hephaestus, would praise Ares and say that they were jealous of his position. Uh, this is not as prevalent in Norse myths at, as the gifts of the dwarves, like Sif's uh, golden hair, Shiblonir, and Mjolnir, for instance, are highly appreciated by the gods, uh, but the dwarves are still treated like something they do not want directly around them, uh, shoving them underground when they have nothing to give them. The dwarves, however, thrive in the environment, and they are also closer to the things that they love, anything that glitters or sparkles. The elves, uh, their lighter and more helpful cousins, are not as central in the surviving Norse myths. Uh, perhaps they were not as interesting as the dwarves, or maybe they just didn't fit the narrative. Because it's very unhelpful in a narrative sense to have a very helpful creature in the myth. So many of the stories with them have not survived. This could also be because the stories circulating around Ullr and his wife Skadi, uh, who are a member of a few stories, uh, Skadi that is, uh, have not survived. Maybe those would have involved more of the creatures of Yusalfheim. Now, both have been presented in the modern world as, Tol as a Tolkien interpretation. There's a lot of similarities between them and the Norse version, though the differences are important to mention. 
and those are mainly related to the elves. Dwarves are dwarves, no matter where they appear. Almost every time they are stocky, cunning, a bit vengeful, and also crafty. But the elves are tiny creatures in, in Norse mythology, more like the Thay in, in Celtic or the Dryads in, in Greek. They also have the same areas of uh, responsibility that would be the forest, the groves, uh, and so on and so forth. Alfheim is also known to be a more fruitful realm with meadows, forests, groves, and bountiful harvests. In fact, it has been connected with the god, uh, the Vanir god, Freyr, many sources claiming him to be the lord over this area, along with it being the haunt of the Esir god connected to hunting and wilderness, Skadi and Ullur. The creation of humans is a departure from other Indo-European myths. In Norse mythology, they have been created from wood, unlike the Greek, where they are created from mud, and the and the Judean tradition of man being created from dust of the earth, very similar to that of the Greeks' uh, mud. I do think that this is because the Germanic culture had, by this story being dominant, moved into the forests of northern Europe. Uh, and the forest, with all its elements, becoming quite central in how the culture was built. There's very little tradition for building things in stone in Northern Europe before the Romanization through Christianity, so wood was very central. Stave churches in Norway and other Scandinavian countries do seem to be the late survivors of that way of thinking. Though in Norway, the tradition of building in wood rather than stone and concrete still stand strong. If you build a house in Norway, it's more likely to be built by wood than by concrete or stone. It's also a departure from other Indo-European mythologies, for instance Greek mythology, that the main gods in the guise of Odin, Willy, and Ve created mankind. Odin, Vili, and Ve, by the way, are not the only ones who have been credited with creating humanity. Uh, there's also instances of Odin, uh, Loki, but in a different guise, in a different name, and Hune being the ones created humanity. So it, it, it varies a lot, but it, it, the version I was taught was Odin, Vili, and Ve. Like humans being created by mud in Greek mythology, someone else gave them shape. In Greek myths, it was Prometheus, one of the few titans not to fight against Zeus, who shapes them, uh, but Athena gives them a soul. The gifts given to the wood shapes that became humans are, uh, are also interesting. Odin, whose name means spirits, gives humanity its soul something that in most cultures seems to be the most important part of being a human. There is a strange thing in the universe of Warhammer 40k, uh, something I've gotten quite interested in over the last few years. Those who follow my Twitter account at uh, J.H. Lilvik in one word um, would know that. The humans known as blanks, which means that they have no psychic connection to the warp, like a regular human would not be a blank. They, they do have some psychic presence, and then you have the psychers up there that would be conduits of, of the warp. Uh, but the blanks uh, have no psychic connections to the warp, which is a realm closely linked to hell and the afterlife. Uh, they have a presence that often repels other humans, and they often are described as having no soul. I like to think that if they had existed in Norse mythology, they would not, they would maybe been seen to not exist without Odin or their spirit. 
Willie renders upon humans their senses and motion, something that can also be linked to his name, meaning will. Uh, these abilities are what you need to set your will into work in the world. It might be a little harder to see that link, but I do think that their names and what they grace upon humanity is linked. And to underline this, uh, they gives humanity blood and healthy skin. Now, blood has very often been linked to holiness. Not so much that the blood, not so much in the blood and soil mentality, uh, which the the far right um, sort of perpetuates, but it might be something that might cause the aggressive views of ethnicity. Blood has been connected to sacrifice in most cultures all over the world. We humans have always known that blood is what gives us life, and therefore it must be what renders us and other creatures holy. So therefore it made sense for early man to connect it to. This might be what is seen with they, holiness, giving humanity blood to cause through our veins. Another sign of the importance of forests in Norse mythology is the world tree, Yggdrasil. Now, it is not the only creation myth or mythology centered around a tree of some significance. Uh, Celtic, Abrahamic, and Greek uh, all have trees central to their stories, but there's something rather special about the Norse world tree, in my humble opinion. Mostly because it connects the entire world and is central to all the worlds in Nor in the Norse universe. It connects the realm of Osgard with the deepest realms of Niflheim, where Nidhogr has its deep pits. Nidhogr is in fact far more important to Norse culture than most people think. The idea that the th three worst things you can do in Norse belief was oath-breaking, adultery, and murder shows that Norse put the word of someone severely high. A person who is seen to break his word was someone deemed to spend the afterlife in an existence of pain. That person was a needing. A needing was among the worst things that you could call someone in the Norse world. There's even a story we might cover from the Icelandic sagas, more precisely Egil's saga, where one of the most famous Norsemen, Egil Skalgrimson, uh, put up what is called a nidstong, uh, basically a pole with a horse's head on top of it. He directed it towards Eric Bloodaxe, uh, the king of Norway at the time. This is something that the saga writers seemed to know how bad, how bad it was. He also predicted that the Landvetter, uh, a version of uh, dwarves and elves, should ensure that Norway would not know peace as long as King Eric sat on the throne. In fact, they didn't. Once his brother Hakon the Good was ready, he would ensure that the throne was his and King Eric took the role as Jarl of Jorvik, now York in the north of England. Another version of Nid was Nidvise, uh, a song to insult and ridicule someone uh, that either the Skald, Chieftain, Jarl or King did not like. Very often such songs and poetry would focus on the cowardice of someone, often in the form of someone who was great at bragging, um, would give their word without any subs substance and, for instance, hide during battle so they would not keep their word. Now, the Norns are a mysterious collection of women. Urd, past, Verdande, now, and Skuld, future, are often portrayed as a young and a middle-aged and an older woman. But they are sisters in the original sources. The three sisters are also goddesses, 
but they are not part of the common pantheon, uh, that of the Esir and the Vanir. They might be part of a set of older gods, almost like Ymir, and perhaps uh, part of an older tradition. They might even have been more important in the Indo-European myth. And they can, in fact, be found in other Indo-European traditions. For instance, in Greek, there are uh, women who have been seen as deciders of destiny. Women in the Norse pantheon have often been connected to the idea of prophecy and being able to pick out those who are meant for great things. Examples of that are the Valkyries and Frigg, Frigg the wife of Odin. But there is no one who is a better symbol than that, than that of the Norns. Perhaps the Valkyries, but that is a story for another day. Uh, we will cover that when we get into the more recent myths. The Norns maintain the world and their advice are greatly valued by the god, shown by the fact that the councils are often held at Urdar, the um, spring of all the water in the world. It might also be a sign that women were far more often taken seriously and more included in decisions in Norse age, um, or at least that would have been the ideal in the gods' eyes. Anyways, uh, thank you all for listening to my second iteration of Fjord Folklore. If there's anything that you think that I'm missing from this creation myth, uh, please uh, leave a comment in the comment section. Uh, support me on Patreon. Uh, all those links will be in the description. And the next time we will focus on the greatest war after the war between the Jotuns and the gods, that of the clash between fertility and war, the war between the Esir and the Vanir. Thank you.